Hello, BookTube. Recently, I watched a video on Doom Antidote in which he walks us through his 10 favorite books of all time. I love videos like that, and I love thinking about that sort of thing myself, for myself, not least because that list isn't frozen in marble. You ask me from year to year, and that list might change a little. Things might change a little on it in their placements. Some things might drop off the bottom and creep in. <laughs> it's entirely possible that if I did this list next year, uh, it would look different, a little bit different than it does now. Some people are not going to have any trouble staying on the list. And keep in mind that a list of your 10 favorite books of all time is different from a list of your 10 favorite authors of all time. That doesn't seem at first like it would be true, but it definitely is. A book is the product of so many different elements, <laughs> right? That don't always combine in the same way with the same effectiveness for even the same author, even in the same year let alone over the course of a writing life. So I decided to make a response video, and I'm hoping that the rest of you do likewise. I want to give you, at least now, in the spring of 2023, uh, my own top 10 favorite books of all time. And we'll start with this one. This is number 10, Tale of Genji. A big behemoth of a thing from a thousand years ago about uh, the doings of court life in, in Imperial Japan centering around one particular character, a character named Genji, who is, uh, well, there's a great deal of verisimilitude in this gigantic sprawling epic, but it's not current verisimilitude, and that leads people into problems with this book. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, it is amazing, absolutely amazing. I'm happy to say that some of you have seen the, the ongoing event being done by Micah Cummins and Anne Novella called Classics and Company, where they take a, a nice slow read through a canonical work and bring on a guest. I'm happy to say that I will be the guest for The Tale of Genji when the time comes. I don't know exactly when that is. Uh, I'm getting conflicting, <laughs> actually conflicting dates as to when that is. It's either in the summer or the fall. But we're going to be going through this uh, in detail. And you can probably count on me for more detail than just what's given. Uh, then the next thing is not... Uh, Doom Antidote stressed fiction a lot in his own list. I imagine that that's inescapable. Most people read fiction, mostly fiction. But for me, mine are all over the map. Of course, there was a there was a poem on his list. There are a couple of poems on mine. But I'm including also works of nonfiction, or at least works that purport to be nonfiction. I had to put Herodotus's histories on the list. Uh, this is the translation by Tom Holland, the noted Spider-Man actor, and this is the Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition. Uh, I love this book. I know that I know and love the long-standing debates about just how realistic it is, just how just whether or not Herodotus knows any of this stuff, whether or not he actually did any of the traveling that he alludes to, what records that he saw, what he checked up on. But I don't really care. I mainly read this for the fun of the storytelling. It never lets me down. Never stories within stories, stories bundled within stories. Uh, then my next choice is Moby Dick by Herman Melville, uh, which is, uh, this is a really neat cover that I actually wish I owned. I don't have a copy of Moby Dick that has this cover, but this, this is, uh, widely regarded as the great American novel. I don't think that's fair. I think that when you're talking about, you know, the great American novel, you have to break it down by century. You can't say otherwise. And I would say the same thing is true of great novels for any nation at any time period. This is certainly the great 19th century American novel. Weird and and urgent and thwarted and psychologically bent and damaged as it is, it is still unbelievably engrossing and grand. The, and the story of revenge, the story of uh, unholy desires, even in a secular world. Just uh, and, and, you know, on the surface, of course, one man's hunt for the white whale that dismasted him. <laughs> Uh, then I wanted to include a couple of slightly more contemporary things. Otherwise, I was starting to feel like when I was going preliminary going over this list myself, I was feeling like an old fogey compared to Doom Antidote, who has all kinds of contemporary things on his list. Uh, so I'll have a couple of those, and one of them was not a hard call to make. This is The Last Hurrah by Edwin O'Connor. This is a, a great American political novel. America is, is a country in the last century, in the last century and a half, that has been entirely... Uh, consumed with politics 
there's no such thing as life as life without politics in America. And that's actually been true from the beginning and before the beginning. Alexis de Tocqueville commented on that a long, long time ago. But considering that fact, uh, there've been an enormous number, a whole a whole bookshelf full of political classics written by Americans that are nonfiction, but hardly any fiction. I think probably because on some DNA level, Americans take their politics too seriously. But this is one of them, and this is the comic one. This is a comic masterpiece, uh, a novel about a battered, old, slightly corrupt urban politician who wants one last run for power. He's getting old, and the world is changing. The old, corrupt, ward politics, of which he is the consummate master, is changing, and he knows that. He knows that this will be the last chance he has to make a run and grab at that office one more time. The, uh, the city in this book is never mentioned. It's never named but it's clearly Boston, and Boston of a very identifiable time period. Uh, and it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. It might not sound it from that description, but Edwin O'Connor has an unbelievable ear for a comic set piece. There are innumerable comic moments in this book, but there are four comic set pieces. And by a set piece, I mean a scene that is a whole and that works as a whole for one concerted comic effect. Uh, any of you who, uh, for instance, are familiar with Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope, there is a consummate comic set piece in that book. Uh, but Trollope is a good example of what a set piece is just in general, right? His fox hunting scenes are set pieces. Almost there's the implication that you could take a set piece out entirely and that would be that. You wouldn't you, the, the narrative would not be maimed in any way. Uh, I don't know about that second part, but this is a joy to reread, absolutely a joy to reread. Uh, and we'll do, we'll have an, another relatively contemporary item here. This is historical fiction. This is The Persian Boy by Mary Raynaud. And this is her novel about, her great novel about Alexander the Great, who was a, a fascination of hers throughout her life and throughout her writing career. She wrote a very strange and wonderful biography of Alexander the Great called The Nature of Alexander, and she wrote three novels that center around Alexander. One is about Alexander's youth, and one, her least successful novel, and I don't think there's any coincidence in that, is sent ar centered around the, the struggles of Alexander's successors. Alexander dies, he exits stage left feet first, right as the book is starting. So, and I think that's probably why there's nothing to animate it. But this is the story of Alexander's career. This is the story of Alexander when he was Alexander the Great. And it's the story of uh, the Persian boy is a Persian eunuch who comes into Alexander's camp and then Alexander's orbit and then Alexander's tent and then Alexander's bed and is therefore uh, has an up close and personal intimate view of everything that happens in Alexander's world. And oh, <laughs> it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. I would argue the greatest thing that this great author ever wrote. Uh, then my next one is... Uh, Doff of the hat to Doom Antidote's video, <laughs> in a way. I mean, this this author definitely belongs on the list. Not the book that I want doesn't exist, but the book did once upon a time exist. But the Doff of the hat isn't for the choice; it's for the format. And if you do this, you should make you should go out of your way to doff your hat to this element of Doom Antidote's video as well as I do, which is that he has assembled in his video. I'll leave a link to his video down below. He has assembled in his video. The most boring covers of the books involved. Just some of the most boring covers imaginable. When the books in question, I mean, he's going through his own books, so there's not much choice in the matter. But the, it, it was killing me. One of the only actually attractive covers that he has, he actually creases before the video, so it's got this big crease. We <laughs> can't take some people anywhere. So I decided, out of cheek, just to make trouble, that one of the covers of one of my choices would be incredibly boring. Now, in this case, I'm aided by the fact that there aren't any good covers of this book. This book doesn't exist, and that is Livy's History of Rome. I picked a really boring cover, but I don't have an assortment of other covers to show you, because as far as I know, there is no mainstream popular publisher that actually runs this thing as a book. It would be long, but it wouldn't be prohibitively long. It wouldn't be any longer than the Tale of Genji, which has had four or five big, big English language editions. Livy, the Roman historian Livy, wrote this book over the course of his whole career, A History of Rome. We don't have all of it, but we have a lot of it. 
And it's never, in a popular English translation, it's never been printed in one book, much less in one book with wonderful old copper plate illustrations and a new introduction and tons of footnotes along every page, onion skin pages, maps, end papers. There's a great volume of this author that, that apparently does not exist, but I, I wasn't about to pick and choose any uh, excerpted or cut up English language edition. I'll just I'll just put Livy on here as one of my choices uh, because he's wonderful. It doesn't sound like it. It doesn't sound like the sort of thing that would be wonderful, but he is wonderful. Uh, then we'll we'll move on to uh, the Canterbury Tales, so a work of poetry by Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, this couldn't not be on my list. I I it's hard to do. It's only ten books, and like I mentioned, these lists can change. These are these are semi-fluid things. <laughs> they, some things are going to be on forever, and of course this list would look different if it were favorite authors. I've done a favorite authors list, and it, it looks slightly different when you're talking about the general entire career of an author. Although, uh, this author pretty much never wrote anything that I didn't love, but but uh, nothing compares to this book, to this, this uh, which a lot of you will be familiar with, because a lot of you were trotted through a couple of these the tales in the Canterbury Tales at school. Uh, the, this also is unfinished, like with Livy, but it is, like with Livy, just alive, completely alive, despite the yawning gap of time between when it was written and now. Uh, that always amazes me. That quality always amazes me. And then we'll do uh, we'll do an overlap uh, with Doom Antidote. This is Middlemarch. I do not have a paperback with this cover, but I rather like it, even though it makes no sense. <laughs> it's not actually connected to Middlemarch. But Middlemarch itself, if you have... If you have looked at this thing glowering down at you from your shelf, it's a big square block of a novel, or if you've heard about it, the universal praise that it gets, booktubers of all ages and stripes occasionally mentioning how much they've read this book and love it, how they venerate it, well, that might be making you feel a little put upon, like, you know, everybody's praising this thing, so I don't want to read it. But this is one of those cases where the book deserves the praise, where it deserves the universal praise that it gets. This is uh, an absolutely great, sprawling, complex, multi-layered world that George Eliot intentionally finds within the very provincial confines of a little town. Uh, that was the whole goal. That was, that was the whole creative sort of conceit of this thing, is that you can find the whole world in a tiny little crossroads village. And she does. And <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, then we'll move to a work of poetry. Uh, another work of poetry. This is The Divine Comedy. Uh, I, I cannot say, you know, this author never displeased me about this book. Dante never displeases, but I find La Vida Nuova a little bit heavy going, whereas the Divine Comedy, this is the cover for the leather-bound Barnes & Noble edition that is the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow translation with Gustave Dory engravings, but m many, many translations into English will capture this if you need a translation into English. It is... Uh, Soaringly wonderful. I, I mentioned many many times before on this channel, I feel a little sorry for readers who only know this from Inferno, the first part, where the main character, Dante, goes to hell and gets a tour of it. I feel a little sorry for readers that read that and never go on to Purgatorio, much less Paradiso, because this poem gets stranger and more exaltated as it goes along. It gets more... Uh, I don't want to say hysterical. <laughs> hysterical is the wrong word. Exalted. It gets more exalted as it goes along. Uh, until finally it reaches the pinnacle, the pinnacle of, of the book, of course, on one level, not on all of the of the horoscope or uh, or numerical, numis, numismatical levels that Dante always compulsively works into his work, but on, an, on a narrative level, the pinnacle of a uh, tour through heaven, pur hell, purgatory, and heaven will be God. Uh, and it's, you don't get that in Inferno. So I always feel a little sorry for people who stop there. And, you know, the publishing industry doesn't help any. I mean, here, this is the Barnes & Noble Divine Comedy. Look how small the pooty are at the, up at the top. But at the bottom, oh, the flames are very visible. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and then we will finish up with one last work of poetry, uh, which is my favorite book. And I, it's going to be on this list anyway. And that is Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is just one cover that I pulled off off the internet. This has been translated innumerable times, and uh, I love all of the translations in one way or another for something that they do or don't do. Uh, most of them uh, in the 21st century, 
there's been at least one translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses that was done specifically to put Ovid in his place, specifically to attack so-called toxic masculinity. Such a translation is a waste of time. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of my time. It was a waste of the translator's time to do. You are you are doing something that is basically a, a Betamax tape. You're you're dating yourself completely right out of the gate. Uh, but and it also you're it's it's impure motives. It's dirty pool. You have an agenda, and it has nothing to do with your uh, your affection for this poem. But for the most part, the the millions of translations that happened before Twitter politics, I can certainly recommend something from each of them. Although I have to admit, as I've said many times before, that even the best of those translations don't capture what Ovid is doing here. Talk about stories nestled within stories. Oh, there's nobody that does it better. There's no work that does it more hallucinatorily than this book does. Stories within stories where the tellers of the story within the story within the story all reflect and refract on each other, extending all the way back up the well to the original narrative thread. Just... That is that is mind-breakingly difficult and challenging and thrilling to follow in the Latin. And it's almost unreproducible in any other language. Or certainly in English. But there are plenty of writers who do a really good job. <laughs> and I love it. I just i it's one of the only books out there in the English in in the, the literary world that I find inexhaustible. It and Dante I find inexhaustible. Uh, but there you go. A little bit of a surprise, yeah, War and Peace is not on this list, Pride and Prejudice is not on this list, and like I say, it could change next year. Uh, they were nudging at me the whole time, those two books were nudging at me the whole time, because I think both of them are almost perfect. Uh, and I can reread. It was, it was a challenging list to make, which is why I'm putting the challenge on you. I want to see what you do. What are your favorite books of all time? And the all time here is a bit tongue-in-cheek, right? Because... We're, we're stressing the fact that next year this list might be different. It won't be totally different. That's true for me. I bet it's true for you, too. If you were to make a list of your top ten favorite books of all time, I bet there'd be three or four books on that list that you know perfectly well, even if you keep a wide open mind as a reader, that you know perfectly well are never going to move from that list. Right? That has to be true. Well, I'm, it's not a rhetorical question. I want to know. So feel free to make this list on your own. Uh, and I will leave a, a link to Doom Antidote's video down below. And I will see you next time. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.